Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord. See, the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Uh, who forgives all your iniquities? Who, who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies you with good? Oh, Lord, have mercy. You need to praise him to make known his ways. You need to praise him from the bottom of your heart. You need to praise him with all of your might. You need to praise and believe in him because God is good and his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. See, somebody out there know what I'm talking about. Uh, there have been some times you done went through some things where you couldn't pull yourself through. And in a moment, in an instant, in your hour of need, in your darkest days, God showed up. He'll wipe your tears away. All he want from you is just a little more worship on today, a little more faithfulness on today, a little bit of obedience on today, some more love on today, forgive somebody today, encourage somebody today, be a blessing for somebody on today. Can I say amen? Now we came into this place to worship. We might be celebrating Independence Day, the 4th of July, but what about the Lord and how he set you free? You know, I found out the more that I surrender and submit myself to God, the freer I am. Get that dead body off your back. Uh, stop carrying around that weight and that struggle that decay and that death. Surrender just a little more to the Lord. It, it, it's first Sunday. We done been through seven months already. Praise the Lord, somebody. See, for some of us, it's just a miracle that we done made it this far. So today, I'm going to praise him while I can. Today, I'm going to praise him anyhow. Amen. Come on, rise to your feet.
want to share this with you. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You might not be able to clap your feet tomorrow, clap your hands tomorrow. You might not be able to stump your feet tomorrow. So, so while you have the time and you still able, the time is now. It's preaching time. It's, it's preaching time. Is anybody, anybody ready for a word from the Lord? Is anybody looking for something from God today? I, I need to. I need to hear some word. The Bible says, how can they believe in whom they have not heard? I want to hear about Jesus today, don't you? I believe that's why you came here today, so you can hear about Jesus. All other stuff that is not going to help you, you need to hear about Jesus today. And we have one that's ready and able, our assistant director of Christian education, Brother Joe Nash, let's encourage him as he comes. Wow. It's been a minute. I feel like I've been on vacation, but I've been here every day. But I was glad oh so glad when they said unto me come let us go into the house of the Lord thank God for our pastor on the day in his absence our assistant pastor in his absence for trusting us enough to be able to stand in his stead giving honor and praises to the first lady of this house Sister Tangela McGee to the first and only matriarch of this house. The Re Dr. I almost called you Reverend. Look out there. Dr. Rosemary Salzman. To you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is good to be here on today. I couldn't help get caught up in that song of praise. The Bible declares that God will inhabit the praises of his people. And I'm looking for some kind of inhabitation today, so I'm on praise in the day, because I can't afford to have no rocks crying out for me. As long as I got a mouth and breath in my body, I will forever give him praise. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is thy name in heaven and earth. There is none like you, O oh Lord, no, not one. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Well, Lord, here we are once again, Father, to stand here in front of your people. And we're asking you, O oh Lord God, to inhabit this place, to anoint these feeble lips of clay, to hide me behind yonder's cross. For, Lord God, I am an unclean, unworthy, cracked, vessel. But I thank God today, oh Lord God, that you trust me enough to stand here representing you. So now, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask that you do a marvelous and magnificent work in this place. Let this word be receivable to somebody, oh Lord God. Let it be believable to somebody today, oh Lord God. Let it be a help today, oh Lord God, and let it be a hope. For we need your Father in these perilous times. Thank you, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And Lord, we ask a special prayer on the Tread Terrell family on today. For the news that we got earlier today, we pray, oh Lord God, that you're already in that place. And that we collectively cannot fall if we stand together. So Lord, we're sending up these praises and prayer in hope that you do what you do so well, which is heal. Thank you, Lord, again for everything you're doing in our life. Now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you just continue to have your way in this service because you are truly the real preacher. Please convict, convince, or convert somebody to the conformity of the Christ. 
and we'll be ever so careful to give you praise, honor, and glory through it all. It's in the mighty, magnificent name of Jesus that we pray, and let every heart say amen. amen. Truly, it is good to be here, and it's remarkable how God navigates your circumstances. You know, we have no control over the aspects of our life and how things are dictated and they go, but we have to trust in the Lord and everything that we do. And I was sitting here and just reveling in the worship service and looked up and one of my oldest ace boom coons from when we were knee high to a grasshopper walked through the door and I about shouted. Pastor Pierce and his lovely bride, thank you for participating and coming out today. They're up here from Texas. That brother been down there so long, he got a twang in his voice now. I, I don't even recognize him half the time when we talk on the phone. I think I'm talking to Tex or somebody, but it's just good to see you, my brother and my sister. But it's time for the word now, my brothers and sisters. Please, if you would, turn with me to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. We're going to drop anchor in the eighth chapter. It's a very familiar passage, familiar text. We hope to find fresh water out of these familiar wells. Romans, the eighth chapter, we're going to start in that 18th verse. And I understand that there are so many different versions of the king's constitution, but if you quietly scan the copy that's yours as I recite from the copy that's mine, which is the NIV version, I believe we'll arrive at the same destination together. Romans 8 and 18 begins with, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Just for a little while, I want to put a tag on this text and talk on the topic of from groaning to glory. from groaning to glory. My brothers and sisters in the New Testament, there is no other writer more prolific than Paul. Out of the 27 total books that compile, complete, and complement the story of our Savior's time here in the flesh, the interest of indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the rise of Christianity resulting in the birth of the church, and the promise of Christ's return, 12 of those books can be directly attributed to Paul. It is no secret that others wrote prolific and profound gospels, epistles, and chronicled factual events during this epic time in history. No, each one putting their own specific and personal stamp on the information that has and will shape the lives of believers until the day of Jesus Christ's return. However, no one other than Paul can lay claim to being most responsible for the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire during the first century. He accomplished this by taking a personal interest in the salvation and redemption process of all those who dared to follow. 
the teachings of an itinerant preacher from Nazareth whom Paul had the pleasure of sharing an impromptu curbside conversation with while making his way along the road to Damascus to persecute followers of the way. Paul experienced an exclusive and inclusive moment with Jesus, which according to his own words, effectually changed his life forever. I believe I'm right about it, for it was Paul who said in Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Yeah, it was Paul who said in Philippians 3 and 14 that I press toward the mark of the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Yes, it was Paul who said in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Right. It was Paul that said, for Christ did not send me to baptize in 1 Corinthians 1 and 17, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Right. It was Paul who said, in Philippians 1 and 21 for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain yeah Paul Paul knew a thing or two about connecting with Jesus Paul the epic writer the prolific profound writer wrote a book by the name of Galatians and I submit on you today if Galatians has been called the magnet charter of the old of freedom and legalism then I'm confident in saying that Romans is Paul's magnum opus his magnum opus. That just means that it's his greatest literary work regarding biblical truths on the gospel, resurrection, salvation, justification, glorification, faith, righteousness, wrath, judgment, repentance, sin, law, redemption, propitiation, grace, predestination, and purpose. Amen, somebody. It is in this vein that Paul's writings flow along this crimson river that Jesus himself put into motion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Paul, Paul knew a thing, a thing about Jesus. Paul was on the tail end of his third missionary journey when he wrote this letter. He wanted to visit Rome, but had not been able to accomplish that as of yet. So he introduced himself by means of this epistle. And unlike his letters to the churches of Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and Galatia, Paul focused his attention on the theological foundation of those who were saved but struggling. And I just stopped by to tell you this morning that just because you saved don't mean you ain't still struggling. Yeah, he, he stopped by to, to, to focus the theological foundation, to focus their attention, and he also wanted to talk to those who were determined to undermine the established connection between God and his creation. Because see, whether you believe it or not, Satan rides in on the back of some Christians when they come to church on a Sunday morning. Everybody in here is not looking for salvation. Some folks are looking for saviorship on, on the world. Everybody's not praying for your deliverance. A lot of folks may be praying for your destruction. Paul focused his attention on these theological situations, on God and his creation and those who follow Jesus. But here it is. Here it is, my brothers and sisters, in this eighth chapter where we're going to drop anchor on the day. The opening verses of the eighth chapter of Romans introduce the profound liberation which comes from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, verses two through four reveal how the Holy Spirit liberates us through Christ. Verses five through 17 tell us what the Holy Spirit gives us as he liberates us. Now in verse 18 where we find ourselves, Paul challenges us to compare the contrast between the hope that we should have in our impending transition to glorification with the inescapable reality of the pain we experience during our carnal existence. Yeah, 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 you see my brothers and sisters, once we can perceive conceptually what God has provided for us contractually, then we can begin to operate continuously in God's plan for our lives. I don't know, Trey, I like that. Let me say that again. Once we can con perceive conceptually what God has provided for us contractually, then we can begin to operate continuously in God's plan for our lives. See, if you aspire to travel from groaning to glory, and I don't know anybody in here today that's tired of, not tired of groaning, I know a lot of folks that's trying to get to glory right now. There are three principles in this text that I want you to share. And that leads me to my first point. Our prospects will not supersede our present. It's right here in the text in verse 18. He says, Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You see, Paul opens this text with a profound declaration. He states that he considers. And what I want you to just take under consideration this morning is God is not concerned with your pain. 
His plan is going to go through whether you like it or not. Sometimes the pain that we suffer and that we deal with while we're dealing with God is for the perfecting of our spirit. So we got to go through some things so that we can get to where God wants us to go. Yeah, he states that he considers or has thoroughly pondered the viability of his or our present condition and determined that no matter how bad it seems, and let me tell you something, my brothers and sisters, no matter how bad it seems, it can always get worse. It still doesn't compare to what God has planned regarding the restoration of his people. See, this statement is even more astounding since it was Paul who applied it to himself. See, it was astounding because when his ship was not sinking or he wasn't being stoned, robbed, jailed, or fighting wild beasts for the entertainment of others, he was being whipped to within an inch of his life. So Paul knew a thing or two about going through suffering for the name of Jesus. And I understand that maybe life is not the way that you want it to be right now. Perhaps things have changed or taken a turn for the worse since you accepted Christ. But I promise you, if you hang in there just a little while longer, that your prospect will most certainly supersede what you're dealing with presently. Paul, 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 Paul went through some serious trials in the name of Jesus just so in order for him to say unequivocally that he was confident in his current circumstances. And his circumstances that he was dealing with did not come close to comparing with his future compensation. He had to be comfortable with his choices. And if I just can poll the room just for a moment, there is no doubt in my mind that in this place right now, somebody is going through something. I just got to ask you, are you comfortable with the choices that you're making in your life? Are you confident in the decisions that you are making? Because sometimes that your mind can play tricks on you. Sometimes your eyes can blind you to what's right there in front of you. Sometimes your heart can be misleading. But if you put your faith in God, trust in the Lord, this Proverbs writer said, with all thy heart and lean not to your own understanding. But if you start to acknowledge him in all your ways... He will direct your paths. No doubt. I got no doubt in my mind in this place that right now there's some folks who are going through something individually or collectively based on their choices. But see, here's the piece. You could also have a lack thereof. Meaning you ain't made a choice at all. God is not like fence walkers. He tells us that we can be neither hot nor cold. We have to pick a side, choose a place, choose a people, choose a line, choose a lane. Because if you don't, the Bible says that he will spew you out of his mouth. Yeah, we, 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 we are making collective choices or lack thereof in regard to Jesus. We must decide if we're going to follow him wholeheartedly, half-heartedly, or with a hardened heart. See, once we determine how we're going to follow him, then and only then can we be led accordingly. So here it is in the language of our text that linguistically speaking, the term our present sufferings does not just denote what was going on then. It also can transfer into what's going on right now. And once we accept this application of this principle, then we may gain a better understanding of God's ultimate plan. And in order to do that, the first thing we must realize is that God's purpose for us is not preempted by our pain. Again, he does not care about the problems that we're having. He does not care about the situations you're going through. He does not care about the issues that you're dealing with. If you're doing it for the name of Jesus, think it not strange that you are dealing with the situations that you are. See, we are being prepared for something in some place better. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And if you're going to go somewhere, think about it like this, my brothers and sisters. On Saturday night, or more importantly, on today or tomorrow, when you get ready to go to that barbecue, you're not going to just jump out of the bed and run out of the house any old way, are you? You're going to wash up, clean up, shower up, shave up, and put on some fresh clothes, and you're going to head out. Because you want to make the best possible impression that you can once you arrive at your destination. Well, Jesus is preparing us the very same way. He's trying to clean us up right now. Because when he presents us to his father, he wants to make sure that we have the best possible impression we could possibly make. 
I know I'm right about it because here it is where Jesus is talking to his disciples in John in that 14th chapter around that third verse where he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me because in my father's house are many rooms. And if we're not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. See, and I thank God today that Jesus is preparing a place for me. See, because anything I touch may be corrupt, may break down, may tear down, may run, I may lose it to focus. But when Jesus makes your room, it don't get no better than that. Yeah, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I'm at. God is preparing us for this promise. Now, unfortunately, pain is a byproduct of the preparation process, which helps us achieve our purpose but rest assured my beloved on today our struggles are only temporal meaning that they're earthly and worldly yet temporary they're spontaneous and yet they're spiritual meaning that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood all the time but one thing for certain they are not strange or uncommon yeah I'm right about it because Peter here and himself in the first Peter 4 12 through 13 wrote dear friends do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering in other words everybody's going through something right now your situation may be bad to you but it may not be as bad as somebody else but rest assured you are either in a storm coming out of a storm or heading into a storm and when you are in the midst of it I know one that can walk on water I know one that can calm the seas I know one that can speak to the wind that will settle it down is there anybody in here today that knows that Jesus is the way yeah Peter says but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ it is a precious privilege that we are able to consider ourselves equal with Jesus yeah, think about it, think about it, think about it. We have many folks that we try to emulate in this life, but everybody that we try to emulate are dirty, dusty creatures just like us. And all you see is what they want you to see. You don't know what's going on behind closed doors, so you better be careful of the folks you're trying to emulate. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed. When the glory is revealed. Yeah, the Hebrew writer put it like this in Hebrews 2 and 18. He says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. What does that mean? That means that Jesus understands your situation. Yeah, he was 100% God and he was 100% man. But he went through everything that we deal with right now. There is nothing new under the sun. Folks were killing folks back then. Folks were raping folks back then. Folks were having, living lascivious lives back then. Folks were in debt back then. Folks were getting put out back then. Folks didn't have transportation back then. Folks didn't have food back then. Folks didn't have clothes back then. The very same things that you deal with right now. Temptation has always been there. Come here, Eve. I believe in the beginning in the garden, temptation was right there. Right there. Eve saw the tree. Eve enjoyed the tree. Eve fell victim to the serpent talking about the tree. But see, we can't put no dirt on Eve. We can't spread no salt on her tail because Eve was the woman in this situation. And I'm not standing here trying to be sexist in any way, but the Bible clearly states that God gave Adam the order. And the moment Adam conceded and fell victim to the wiles of the enemy, meaning Satan, not his wife, he ended up falling into disrepair with God and the fall of creation happened. And from that point on, we have been living under a curse. But Paul says, take heart. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 17, he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. See, this body, this fleshly temple, we do all these things to make sure that it looks good. But I'm going to be honest with you, and it's just me. I can't say nothing about you. I don't care what kind of corpse I look like. Because at the end of the day, dead is dead. I don't need to be buff. I don't need to be trim. I don't need to be lean. I don't need to be grayed out or blacked out or bald. I just need to be with Jesus. Because the Bible tells me it don't matter how I leave this place. It's when I come back. I'm going to look like him. For the light 
our light and momentary troubles, the things that we're dealing with right now are only for a season. You do know that, don't you? This is not going to last for you always. Your situation will turn around. It's going to change. It will get better. If you remain steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, he says a workman need not be ashamed. And see, if you want to deal with these problems that you're dealing with, if you want to go from groaning to glory, you got to get in your word. There's no other way. You can't buy your way in. You can't talk your way in. You can't walk your way in. You can't dress your way in. You can't do enough good deeds to get in. The only thing you can do is call Jesus your Savior and meet it with the bottom of your heart. Momentary troubles are achieving for us an internal glory that far outweighs them all. Yeah, 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 yeah. We see that not only is our present that will transform us, but we also recognize that our prospects will transcend us. See, what we have to wrap our minds around is the end result of our transformation greatly exceeds the problems we endure while traveling on this road from earth to glory. I know I'm right about it because here it is again. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. That means that this regeneration process, this transformation process, is an ongoing process. It's perpetual, meaning it didn't just stop when you accepted Christ in your life and he took you into his kinship. It's a continuation that you have to consistently strive to get to. See, and that's a problem for some of us. Some of us don't want to work. Some of us want to take the easy way out. Some of us want to fast track our way into heaven. There ain't no fast track to get into heaven. It's time. It's tried. It's true. You have to take your time. See, when you move too fast, you miss a lot. You miss out on a whole lot when you move too fast. We need to slow down. We need to back it down. We need to break it down so that we can get a better understanding of what God is trying to do for us right now. Yeah, Paul says it right there. He says, if we would unveil faces, we will reflect God, the Lord's glory. But I love the way that the psalmist put it because, see, I told you that the situations that we're dealing with are temporal. The issues that you concern yourself with are temporal. How do we know? For it says it right here in Psalms 30 and 5, for his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning and when we receive that joy when we start to rejoice for what God has done for us it will be a cumulative cry for those who recognize that God's purpose for us is preserved by his promises yeah see God's purpose for us is preserved in other words God has purposed all of us for something you may not know what your purpose is we are still trying to walk through the perfected state that God is trying to get us to to determine what best he wants us to do. We don't all know, have a plan set in stone how God wants us to react, how he wants us to live, how he wants us to travel, who he wants us to spend time with, who he wants us to minister to, who he wants us to evangelize to. We have no idea. But he has promised us that he will be with us every step of the way. Paul knew that God had promised to restore and renovate his handmade crowned but crippled jewel with a new and improved version. Yeah, Philippians 3.21 tells us that who by the power that enables him to bring everything. He didn't say some things. He didn't say a few things. He said everything. And from where I come from, everything means everything under his control and this will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body see let me let me see if i can help you see it in 1941 excuse me the great theologian c.s lewis preached a sermon at a church in oxford he entitled this sermon the weight of glory 
In it, he gave as eloquent as explanation as has ever been given in reference to God's promises for saved mankind. Now, normally, Brother Lewis could get pretty deep in his homilies. I mean, he would say some stuff that would have your head spinning. But this time, he stated that the promises of Scripture could be reduced to encompass these five headings. You need to write these down. Number one is we shall be with Christ. Number two says we shall be like Christ. Number three says we shall have glory. Number four says we shall be feasted. And number five says we shall have some official position in the universe, Darnie. See, and I don't know about you, but that's good news. Because see, even if you're the garbage man in heaven, you're still above everything else. Even if you're the lowliest of the lowliest in heaven, you are still above everything else. Because remember one thing, my brothers and sisters, the floor that you'll be standing on there is the ceiling for somebody else. God will make a way. Yeah, that's good news, my brothers and sisters. And I don't know about you, but I want to look like Jesus. See, I, I want to be with Jesus. I want to share like Jesus. I want to have glory like Jesus. I want to sit down in a feast with Jesus. And I want to have a position that's with Jesus. Because, see, when you're with Jesus, he is more than the world against you. God will make a way. It is, Jesus himself said in Matthew 13 and 43, he says, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. I believe that our prospects, my brothers and sisters, truly supersede everything else. Belief in what the scriptures say will change our lives. Right? Some of us need to have our eyes lifted from the dirt toward the heavens. Amen, somebody. Stop looking down and start looking up. There is simply no comparison of our pleasure or pain with the glory that is yet to be revealed. See, I, again, weeping may endure for a night, but understand something. Joy most certainly will be coming in the morning. Not just our prospects, but the prospects of creation as a whole has suffered, and they then in turn will benefit on that great getting up morning. Which leads me to my next point. Our fruition will surpass our frustration. Here it is in verses 19 through 22 of your Bible still open. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. In other words, it did nothing wrong to get it in the state of being that it's in. It was, it was subject to collateral damage. But by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Yes. Creation is groaning. You see it every day. There's famines. There's pestilence. There's floods. There are fires. There are hurricanes. There are tornadoes. They're earthquakes. These are all the byproduct of sin. Everything that this world deals with on that level is a byproduct of sin. See, it's right here where Paul shifts his focus to the state of creation, which was cursed because of the disobedience of man. So creation didn't do nothing wrong. God made the animals to obey. God made the plants to obey. God made the winds to obey. God made the waters to obey. But once man got involved, once we decided that we knew better than God, that's when everything started to suffer. See, the curse of sin upon all creation has been brought much suffering. Sin's pleasures, my brothers and sisters, in case you didn't recognize it, are very short in duration. See, it's the old adage when you eat that donut a minute on your lips and a year it's on your hips. Well, sin is the same way. <laughs> that momentary pleasure will ruin you for a lifetime. There are many folk out there that are walking testimonies to that momentary pleasure. I thank God today because I've had my share of momentary pleasures. I thank God today 
that no matter how bad I wanted to be, God was always better than me. And thank you, Jesus, for loving me through it all. Even when I was not faithful, you were faithful unto me. Yeah, see, somebody knows what I'm talking about here. That grace thing, see, that's that grace that we talk about on a daily basis. God's riches at Christ's expense, stuff you're getting that you don't deserve. He's just doing it because he wants to. And I don't know anybody today that just want to do something for you because they just want to. And see, the best part about it is he's not looking for nothing in return. He's not a God of reciprocity. He gives you freely and forever, and I thank God today for all that he's done for me. Short-lived. We often say this, I thank God I don't look like what I've been through. I'm going to put this a different way. Thank God I don't have what I've been to. I'm just talking about me. That's my praise. That's why you won't ever beat me shouting. Because I know what God has done for me. I may not know what you've been through, but I know what I've been through. And I thank God today in this place. Our fruition will surpass our frustrations. See, here it is, Paul is picturing an animate and inanimate creation eagerly waiting for the sons of God to come into their true glory. What he is saying is that we are inalienably connected to everything. There is nothing that is separate from us. And everything that is connected is connected to God. So he has total control over every aspect of every second, of every moment, of every day in our lives. And I don't know about you, but that's shout material right now. Because I'm, I'm glad that he's the navigator of my circumstances. I'm glad that he's the light unto my feet and the lamp unto my path. I'm glad that he is my strength and my redeemer. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for me. Here it is, Paul is connecting everything together. And when you start to think about it, and this is one thing that I have come to realize in my years on this earth, is that you have to be patient when it comes to God. God is not going to move in your time. He is going to move in the fullness of his time. And since he is the one who created time, I think he knows better how to handle my time than I know how to do it myself. We've got to be patient. But I understand for some of us, that's a difficult investment to make. Patience, my brothers and sisters, is truly a virtue. And it takes a virtuous person to have patience because there are some folk that know how to rub you the wrong way. Some folk can get on that last, you know that last nerve, you got the one that you tuck and hide and wrap and keep covered up. There's some folk that know how to come right up to you and they just, and you just sing. And they set you off. Some folk know, and the reason they know how to do it is because they are operating under the guise of satanic principle. Did you catch that? See, they're operating under the guise of satanic principles, meaning Satan has a Rolodex on your life. He knows how you like it, when you like it, where you like it, as often as you like it, when you like it, and what you like to do with it when you get it. 
And because of that, he's got no problem with popping that trigger every chance he gets. The problem that we have is we are not a fast study. We see something that we know we shouldn't be involved with our situation, circumstance, whatever it may be. And you recognize all the signs are there. But because of the hard-headedness, stiff-neckedness, stubbornness that is within us, the pride and vanity that caused the fall from the beginning, because that still is in us, we still attempt, try to convince ourselves that it's all right to do what we are doing. We are not willing to wait on the Lord. We want things quicker than right now. We want things sooner than after a while. But let me drop this on your spirit, my brothers and sisters. Our microwave mentality has minimized our maturity. I believe I need to say that again. Our microwave mentality has minimized our maturity. We got to learn how to wait on God. Because see, when we get to that point in our lives, this is what leads to the frustration. Mick Jagger said it best. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. He says, I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I can't get no satisfaction. That's because we are searching for happiness when we should be concentrating on joy. Happiness is fleeting. It's momentary. It can leave at the twinkling of an eye, but joy stays with you forever. Why is that? Because the world didn't give it to you. This is what leads to our frustration. Ours is based on self-preservation and creations is based on anticipation. So our frustration is, is driven by our, our, our desire to self-preserve. And you do know that once you sin, when you get caught up in your sin, you either fight or flight, right? Most time, we go into self-preservation mode. Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor, one of his best, one of his best comedy routines had him discussing a chain time when he was on tour and he had went up into this place that he shouldn't have been. And uh, he'd been there a few times and somebody somehow got in touch with his then wife and she came to where he was. She knocked on the door and the door was open and there he was in all his glory. And the funniest thing about this was he went on to tell her, it wasn't me. And she said, well, I saw you. I'm looking at you. He said, it wasn't me. She said, but I'm standing right here. I see, I see the mole where nobody else should know. It wasn't me. And he goes back and forth with her as he's getting dressed. And as they're walking out the house, he asks her a very pertinent question. He says, are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? And all I stop here to tell you today is that your eyes will lie to you. Trust in your heart for what God has planned for your life. Yeah, this is what leads to our frustration. We are unable to wait. But we are not the only ones who must learn to wait. Creation itself must be subjected to waiting. It says it right here in Isaiah 40 and 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but I'm ready to start soaring with the eagles and stop running with these chickens. Paul, Paul, uses word pictures at this point to indicate that the denoted passion and posture in its expectations. So here it is. Creation says it is waiting in eager expectation. And when you start to look at the collection and the way those words are broke down in the Greek, it gives the information or the simulation that it is as a child would be standing on its tiptoes, peering over the wall and through the glass, waiting on something to come its way. 
And I can recall as a child when I heard the ice cream truck's music. It couldn't see it. I couldn't even tell it was in the area, but I heard the music. And all the while I heard the music, I would stand there in anticipation, waiting eagerly for it to show up. That's how we are right now. We are eagerly anticipating and waiting on Jesus to come on back. Waiting eagerly with expectation, but not, not so that it denotes the passion and posture, but it also divulged the personage and the prospects of its anticipation. It says here in 19b, the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Well, the sons of God are those who will be restored to their rightful place in glory and right relationship with God, i.e., I am a son of God. You are a son or daughter of God. We are those that they are waiting on. We are the fallen man creation that once the day of redemption comes and until it comes, nothing can be changed until we are changed first. That's why creation is waiting so, so, so fervently and so, so, so much. They're waiting on it to come. But not only is it a denoted passion and a divorced person, but we see the defining problem and predicament for his frustration. It's the frustration of creation is the product of the collateral damage caused by Adam's disobedience. See, God originally created everything in perfect form. In Genesis 1, after he each spoke an act of creation during the first six days, God declared, it is good. And when he had made man in his own image, he declared it was good. However, when man allowed the sin of pride and vanity to consume him, he determined that what God had done wasn't good enough. And see, that speaks volumes to us today, my brothers and sisters, because sometimes we don't think that what God is doing is good enough for us. We spend so much time trying to get better, we can't get out of our own way to receive the blessings that God has already positioned us to receive. One man allowed the sin of pride and vanity to consume him. And when we place more emphasis on ourselves and less on God, it causes trouble for us as well others are connected to it. Meaning simply this, in Proverbs 16 and 18, pride goeth before destruction. So a prideful spirit will lead to destruction, not just your destruction, but everybody that you're connected to will suffer some kind of collateral damage from what you were doing. That's why families today are already being broken down because somebody in the family, the that they knew better for themselves than God knew for them. And now you've got generations and generations of individuals dealing with stuff that they should not have to deal with. Pride goes before destruction in a haughty spirit before the fall. Yeah, see, man's disobedience caused God to declare a curse on all creation as punishment. It's right here in Genesis in the third chapter in the 17th verse. He says, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife. See, when Adam got caught up in that whole situation, the first thing he said it is her fault. And when that didn't work, he went on further to say, well, God, is really your fault because you're the one who made her. You gave her to me. If you hadn't given it to me, I'd have been okay. I'd have never touched that tree. I never would have eaten that fruit. I'd have been fine sitting right here under this bush. But you, God, determined that it wasn't right for man to be alone, so, you know, it's on you. Right? So he says, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. And see, that's a twofold curse. Because not only was the ground that man was walking on cursed, but the ground that man was created out of now became cursed. You will be painfully extolling what you eat of it all the days of your life. All the days of your life. But fret not, my brothers and sisters, because there is deliverance pains and position in this, of this fruition. What the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into its glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Now, again, this is just me. I ain't never been there. I've been in there, but I ain't never been there. I have no idea whatsoever what it feels like to push a watermelon through a straw. No clue. But I've been there in the room and I've witnessed it. 
And I can tell you something right now. When my youngest daughter was born, the Bears were playing Green Bay. And I'm an avid sports fan. It was the year after the Super Bowl. And I'm watching this game, and, 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 and the wife was in labor, and she was like, you know, we've been to these classes. You're supposed to be over here coaching me. And I said, well, it looks like you're doing pretty good there, sister. You just keep on going. I got you. <laughs> Third and four. Give me a minute. This woman let out a scream, a blood-curdling scream, one that I have never heard ever again in my life. She grabbed hold of my wrists, and she dug her nails in so deep, it took 15 years for that scar to disappear. So I don't know physically what it feels like. But when y'all groaning, I truly empathize with you. So creation as it stands right now is groaning in the pains of childbirth. And as bad, and I'm not talking about you, but as rough as y'all look when you're right at that moment of giving birth, you look that much more beautiful afterward. So here's what I want you to think about for a moment. If you think about the most beautiful scenic place you have been, witnessed, saw on TV, saw in person, close your eyes and just think about you being there right now. Think about it like this. As beautiful as that is, it is working under a curse. How much more beautiful will that be when the curse that God has placed on creation is lifted? I can't even fathom the glory, I mean, when I peer up in the skies at night and I can't count the number of stars that are there and when I haven't heard the backup beep of the tow truck pulling the moon up every evening, when I can't see God's fingers spinning the earth around on his axis, when I can't even reconcile the strings that are holding us in this solar system, when I think about the vastness that goes way beyond what the naked eye can see, it gets better than that when creation comes off from under the curse. Louis Armstrong, y'all know Satchmo, don't you? Had a song, What a Wonderful World. Did you ever really listen to those lyrics? I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and for you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. That does not do it justice to how it's going to be when Christ comes back. I can't wait to see it. My mind can't fathom it. My mouth can't formulate words to describe it. But I know one thing for certain. What's to come is sure enough better than what's been. Because see, what we are looking for is liberation. John 3 and 8 and 36 says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Yeah, Paul knew something about that because he came right back in 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. He said, now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I think the King James says there is liberty. So I want to make sure that wherever I am, God is. Because once I know God is in the room, that means some of these shackles that we've been walking around with will be broken loose and let go of. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me. So we see the prospects will supersede our present, and we have now witnessed that our fruition will surpass our frustrations. And lastly, what we look at here is our redemption will suppress our remorse. It's right here in these last few verses. <clears throat> Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Somebody say hope. hope. See, hope is what you got when your help ain't there. And you got to hang on to your hope till your help comes, right? But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Because what would you be hoping for if you already got it? 
right? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. There's that word again, patiently. And the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Now, I don't want to see a show of hands. I, I'm going to poll the room for a minute. But is there anybody in here like me who have come up on situations, circumstances, or issues in your life where you just didn't feel like praying? Don't show me your hand. That's between you and God. <clears throat> I think everybody at some point in their life have had faltering faith. In other words, you are looking and saying, God, it don't make no sense if I ask you for it or not because I don't see it getting any better. But see, that's why we are faith walkers. That's why the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. See, the thing we groan for is our adoption as sons, which will be completed by the redemption of the body. We are already God's sons and daughters, so we already have that, that personage and we already have that family connection, but we will not be complete for eternity until we get out of these bodies. Paul right here in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2 says, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, that means your body, we have a building from God an eternal house in heaven, not built with human hands. You do know if the human touches it, it's going to come down, right? Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Yeah, we also groan because of the mystery of living in our fallen bodies in this fallen world. See, what I mean by that is this. Somebody woke up today hurting. Back hurt, leg hurt, head hurt, elbow hurt. Blood pressure was high, sugar was low, hypertension was off the chart, right? You were, you were going through this morning. These are all byproducts of the sin that is still in this world. What are you talking about, preacher? You mean if I, uh, my, my sins are uh, keeping me the way they am? No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. Here, here's what I'm talking about. See, I, and I was sharing this with my class this morning. If you are fluffy, you know what fluffy is, right? Fluffy. Come on, Fluffy. You don't know what Fluffy is? All right. Obese. I don't want to offend no. You're fluffy. You're fluffy, okay? You just, it's like a big marshmallow. You're just fluffy. Just fluffy. It's nice. If you are fluffy and you know you have issues inside and you choose not to do anything about your fluffiness, Meaning that physically you are able to do something with it, but mentally you are not willing to do anything with it. And your hypertension increases. And your blood pressure goes up. And your sugar starts to drop. And all of a sudden they got you on insulin and everything. And now you complain and I don't know why I feel this way. I can't seem to get no energy. My knees hurt. My feet hurt. My neck hurt. My elbow hurt. When these things start to hurt on you, it's because we have been disobedient to what God has planned for us to do. And because of that, we are now suffering through the consequences of our own actions. We groan. Because of the misery of living in these fallen bodies. And that's a negative reason for our groaning. However, there is also a positive reason. James himself said it in James 1 and 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all created. We have the first fruits of the spirit. We have the first installment or down payment of the inconceivably fabulous heritage God has prepared for us. In other words, when he's ready, we are the first ones to go. Hallelujah, somebody. That should get you a little excited when you think about God cares that much about you that he set aside a special place just for you so that when he's ready for you, he will call you up to be with him. See, let me help you with that. When Abraham's servant was sent to find a bride for Isaac and, he, and meet Rebekah, he gave silver and gold garments and presents to Laban as indications of what was to come. 
And that's exactly what God has done for us by giving us the Holy Spirit. For he says when we got the Spirit, we got a comforter. And that comforter will teach you and preach you about me. Right? The, the indescribable peace we knew when we first experienced the forgiveness of our sins, the power of God that calms our heart despite circumstances, the joy that floods our souls. These are mere foretastes. This ain't the whole enchilada. This is just the door prize, my brothers and sisters. We ought to be striving to get what's behind door number one. These are just the foretaste of what is yet to come. Because what's to come, my brothers and sisters, is better than what's been. And when we start to understand that there has been a release in our redemption, for he says it here in verse 24, he says, For in this hope we were saved. When a person is saved, they come into a great hope where they are formerly had none. Salvation brings to the believer hope that the world can never take away. Don't ever let nobody stop you from hoping on Jesus. Don't ever let nobody compromise your values or belief system. Don't ever let nobody challenge you and you back down on the one that you know saved you oh so long ago. Not only is there a release of our redemption, but there's a realization concerning our redemption because he goes on to 24b to say, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? What Paul is talking about here is it's not something visible, but it is something that is realized, right? And that's what, what, what the Bible says. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, right? And the evidence of things not seen. Amen, somebody. It, 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 it's, it's our hope that drives us every single day. This hope says there is more in store for the redeemed than what has already has. Seeing is truly not believing. But my brothers and sisters, believing is truly seeing. See, we understand that there's a release for the redemption and a realization for the redemption, but there's also restraint in the redemption. It's right here in verse 25. It says, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. There's that word again, patiently. The greatness of the hope increases the patience in waiting. The greatness of the hope gives the saint more patience to endure adversity. The hope that we have in Christ Jesus should help you get over every mountain, every valley, every river, every pothole, everything that's standing in the way of your movement. Your hope should be enough to keep you pressing on. If we were honest with ourselves, we must admit there are times when we cannot pray. I just told you that. There are times when you just don't feel like it. You don't think there's anything good going to come out of it. You don't believe that any change will come about. But let me rest assured and tell you this right now. Prayer changes things. The Bible says the prayer of the righteous availeth much. Prayer. Changes things. We have recognized now that our prospects will supersede our present. I also wanted to stop by to tell you that our fruition will surpass our frustrations. <clears throat> Lastly, we've discovered that our redemption will suppress our remorse. And I just stand here today, my brothers and my sisters, to tell you it's okay if you ever feel like you just don't want to pray. There's a problem that you may have when you go out to ask God for your favor. Chances are you asking God for something that you don't truly need. We're busy trying to tell the Lord that we need a new car and more cash and a new crib. We're saying that companionship is what is required for me to do for you, Lord. But I just stopped by to tell you this morning that the only companionship that you need to have is the one that is required by the Lord. You ought to be a friend to Jesus because Jesus is a friend indeed God I said God has made it available for us to have fellowship with him 
Yeah. God of oh God has said, I hear when you're groaning. I know that you're aching. I feel your pain. But trust in me in all that you do. And I promise I'll make a way out of no way. Thank you, Jesus. There's a problem with our praying. But not only is there a problem, but we are starting to exhibit a little passion. For those groanings are a passionate plea to our Lord. We need you now, Father, to look down from heaven to help us through our circumstance. Thank you, Lord, for Calvary. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me. Thank you, Lord, for covering me. Teach me, Father, on this day how I should pray. You showed us in your Bible. He said, bow down with body bowed and head bent. And you open up with our Father. Our oh, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. Give me, give me, give me my day, my daily bread. And deliver me from my trespasses. As you deliver those that I've trespassed again. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us when we don't know how to pray. That if we can't say nothing else, just holler out our Father. I need you now, Lord, to do something immeasurably, unequivocally, majestically in my life. And I know, I said I know, I know that what I'm going through won't last always. Paul, that writer, that man they call Paul, said one more thing after these verses it's the money verse in the eighth chapter he went on to say all things all things not some things not a few things but he said all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord are you in here today Messiah if you love the Lord, let me see you wave your hand. If you love the Lord, let me see you clap your hand. If you love the Lord, let me see you hug your neighbor. Because how can you love the Lord and the one you haven't seen and hate the one you're sitting next to? I don't know how you feel about it, but I thank you, Jesus that all things work together for the good of them that love God to them who are the called are you called today are you called today to them who are called according to his purpose I thank you Lord that you called me one Friday I thank you, Lord, uh, that you desired me one Friday because uh, you went from one trial to another 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 trial. And when they couldn't try you no more, uh, they went on at that point and determined you had to die. But thank you, Lord. You told him, Lord, can't no man take my life, but I will give it freely unto you. So thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for keeping me. Because you walked up that mount bearing that tree. You had me on mine for every step that you took. And I thank you, Father, for all that you've done for me. When you took the first nail, 
I should have cried out. But all I can say is thank you. When you took the second nail, I should have said mercy me. But all I can say is thank you. When you took the third spike, I should have been crippled. But Father, you allowed me to see another day. And then when they hung you wide and stretched you wide, you looked all around and you said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Thank you, Lord, because I don't know what I'm doing. Thank you, Lord, that you're watching over me. But that ain't the end of the story, because they say he hung from the ninth to the sixth hour, and then he decided it was over, it was finished, it was complete, and he said, Father, unto you I commend my spirit. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me. But they left them there just for a little while. Then Joseph came and said, let me have that body because I got a tomb that I want to put him in. And they dressed him up and they wrapped him up and they took him away. And my brothers and my sisters, I don't know how you feel about it, but I thank God that he died. I thank God that he died. Thank you, Jesus, that you died. But as thankful as I am for you giving your life for me, I'm more thankful for what you did early on Sunday morning. Because he got up. He got up. He got up. Yeah. He got up with all power. All power. All power in his hands. Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? If he's all right, then say yeah. 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 From groaning to glory, let's bless God for the preacher. As we're standing all over the building, as we're standing all over the building, I, I need us, I need us to go into prayer mode right now. This is the most important part of the service. I need you, I need us all to be on one accord saying, Lord, rebuke the devil long enough for the individual that you're trying to save to come forward. We need to be on the same page right now. This is the most important part of the service. God is more concerned about the one that's lost than the 99 that's already saved. And as we go into this meditative prayer, Let's think about where you were when the hour came. And I believe there's somebody here today that wants to give their life and heart to God. And we're praying for you even right now that Satan is rebuked. And I know he's in your head telling you that this is not the time. But you don't know how much time you have left. So we need to be on the same page praying for these individuals. If God is talking to you now, you don't have to woo far. We'll come get you. Because you're in a room full of sinners. Nobody is greater than you are right now. And we need you to be free. If you're here today, would you come? Every eye is closed. Every eye is closed. You can come right now. Nobody can see you. We'll lead you down the aisle. Just move out and, and touch somebody, and they'll help you to get here. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we know what this service is all about. 
we know what this hour means, Lord, and we know that you're ready for an unbeliever to be a believer, Lord, and we ask that you move by your power to loose the shackles that's holding them back even now. We ask, Lord, that you free them, Lord, give them freedom of mind, body, and spirit to move out on your word, Lord, knowing that you will receive them, Lord, with a welcome arm, Lord. We ask today that you move in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you free us, Lord, and as a church to love them, Lord, the way that you send them, knowing that you'll make them better. And Lord, we ask this prayer in your darling son Jesus' name, and the people of God said amen. amen. Is there one today that will come? This will be the best decision of your life, to give your life to Christ. waiting for you. Amen. We see that there's none, but there's room. As you take your seats, let's give God some glory for this preacher today.